To achieve air supremacy, a commander needs to come up with a set of orders for all the combat aircraft in the theater of operations. These orders are collectively known as the Air Tasking Order, or ATO, and they are the daily blueprint for combat operations. So what goes inside the ATO? We'll talk about that in this video. Before we jump into ATOs, I wanted to mention some of the other aspects of an air war that are just as important as a list of things that need to be bombed. You don't want friendly aircraft accidentally wandering into air defense zones, and everyone needs to be working on the same rules of engagement. These aspects are all spelled out in some documents that accompany the ATO each day, and I wanted to give a brief overview of them. An airspace control order is going to contain a plan for deconflicting airspace in an operational area. In other words, where friendly aircraft should and should not go to avoid fratricide. Then we have SPINS, which is shorthand for Special Instructions. This is a set of instructions that provides information not otherwise available in the ATO. So the communications plan that lists what frequency each flight should be on, that's in here. And what about the plan for rescuing down pilots? That's in here too. Rules of engagement can also have their own document. These are special rules issued by a higher authority that places restraints on the use of force. So it could be rules placing certain targets off limits or establishing guidelines for identification before a shot is authorized. We'll go over this in more detail in a future video. ATOs are made to cover a 24-hour period. So if a JFAC has enough air assets to take one 20% chunk of the target list in a day, then you could reasonably expect there to be five ATOs for five days of fighting. Now you may be wondering, why not just make a single ATO to cover all five days? The reason is that combat is very chaotic and difficult to forecast. You don't know what the situation will be like tomorrow. If you lost an airframe in today's mission, it won't be available for the next four days worth of missions. Now it would take longer to get to all the targets on the list. Or some new threat might pop up and the target list grows longer. So it's just safer to work one mission cycle at a time. And since that's usually one day, ATOs are organized into 24-hour cycles. Once the day's ATO is completed, it gets sent out by the JFAC staff to the air crews that will be executing it. The JFAC can usually be found at the Joint Air Operations Center. Here's the Air Operations Center for CENTCOM at al Udeed Air Base in Qatar. You can see that the JFAC staff is pretty big. You'll also find liaisons from other services and even from other combatant commands like Cyber and Special Operations here. And as a side note, the Air Operations Center is where this channel gets its name from. So far, we've talked about the JFC, the JFAC, and the JOC. If an operation becomes a multinational effort, then these acronyms would change. The J at the front would become a C. Depending on the organization, it could stand for either coalition or combined. Either way, it means a multinational effort is in effect, and you can expect to see a CFC along with the CFAC running things. And the central control hub would be called the KOC. NATO operations fall under this structure, and other than a name change, they work exactly the same. When it's time to start operations, the Air Operations Center will send out the ATO to subordinate units known as Air Expeditionary Wings, or AEWs. These are the people on loan from the service chiefs at a deployed location, and it's the wing commander staff at each of these bases that receives the ATO. Since they don't want to hand out the entire ATO to every air crew, they'll break it apart into more manageable chunks at the wing in a process called shredding. Each of these chunks is called an ATO fragment, or FRAG for short, and just contains the necessary details for a specific mission. Usually it's just enough for an individual flight to know when and where they need to be. Today this is done in a secure online app, but it used to be sent out in a printable format where each individual fragment would look something like this. At the top we see the unit being tasked and the ICAO name for the airfield that they're at. In this case it's Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada. You can tell when a line ends with this double slash. So if you don't see that double slash, it means the line is continued below. Next we see the mission data line. This is the name of the mission with the two letters indicating the day of the operation. AA is the first day, AB would be the second, and so on. 01 makes this the first mission of the day. Eagle 2-1 will be the flight's call sign. Whenever we see a dash, it just means that the field was left intentionally blank. OCA stands for Offensive Counter Air, and it's the type of mission. Here we see the mission will depart and arrive back at Nellis. A frag isn't complete without indicating what type and number of aircraft will be going on the mission. 
This one happens to be two F-15E Strike Eagles. And this mess of numbers and letters is code for what each one will be carrying. The part in front of the first X means two GBU-15 guided bombs. This means two AMRAAM missiles and lastly two AIM-9 missiles. There's a special name for this listing of what the aircraft will carry. It's the SCL, which stands for Standard Conventional Load. The fourth line shows our target location, which is called Redland Airfield. Now we see that it has a no earlier than time here and a no later than time here. The Z indicates that these times are in Zulu, which is what the military calls GMT. So not only do we have a place to attack, but a time that the JFAC wants it to be attacked. The time is important because this target could be a problem for later missions. Targets like early warning radars, air defenses, and air bases with interceptors are things that need to be handled early on to make the air safe for other missions. So if there's a time listed on the ATO, then it needs to be met. We see some other information about the target that's wrapped to the next line. Here it says East Revets, which is talking about revetments like these that are used to protect parked aircraft or other important assets. And after all that, we see DIMPI ID. DIMPI stands for Designated Mean Point of Impact. It means a geographic spot that's in the middle of your targets, which in this case is a set of revetments. This gets the air crew to look at one location and then gives them the freedom to target things as they see fit. The DIMPI here has a northing coordinate denoted by this letter N and a westing coordinate denoted by this W. Beside that is an elevation above sea level. Lastly, we have the contact information for the controller for this mission, which will be from this air control squadron. We have radio frequencies and a call sign mentioned here, as well as a telephone number in case the F-15 crews want to speak directly with them before the mission starts. In this fragment, we have just one target. But it's not uncommon for a secondary target to be added in case the primary can't be serviced for some reason. You might hear this referred to as a dump target. After seeing what a frag looks like, you might be wondering, why is it so cryptic? The reason for its brevity is that the ATO originated in an era when orders had to be either transmitted over a low bandwidth secure connection or printed out and hand carried to the wings. This is exactly what happened in Desert Storm. U.S. forces had never deployed in these kinds of numbers to the Middle East. So there weren't enough secure facilities for every air unit to have a secure network terminal to get the ATO. The only way to get the ATO out to everyone was by courier. That meant that every night each wing sent a pilot to the CAOC in Riyadh to pick up a printed copy of the ATO. Then the ATO had to be flown back in time to get the day's missions ready. There were over 2,700 coalition aircraft involved, so you can imagine just how huge the ATO was. Minimizing the amount of space it took up helped to make it possible for a courier to carry it. But it also eased the load on the very limited secure connections available at the time. Today, secure bandwidth isn't a problem, so ATOs can take up more space. Now, one thing we haven't covered yet is a type of ATO fragment where instead of a specific target, a flight is told to simply be available for a tasking during a window of time. So a flight of fighters might be tasked to patrol a specific area of airspace for a three-hour window. During that time frame, they would respond to calls from a controller to intercept any intruders inside this airspace. This is known as a Defensive Counter-Air Combat Air Patrol, or DCA CAP for short. In the next video, we'll talk about what a DCA CAP does and how it helps the JFAC attain air supremacy. So I hope you'll come back for that video, and thanks for watching.